Rachel Cohen, senior policy reporter at Vox, to discuss her piece, How State Governments Are Reimagining American Public Housing. Rachel, thanks so much for being here. Thank you guys for having me back. Of course. Uh, good to see you again. And uh, congrats, congrats on the new-ish gig at Vox. Um, hoping to read more and more about your reporting or read more and more of your reporting over there. Uh, before we dive into some of the the more current elements of your piece, I wanted to talk a bit about the history of housing in this country and how we got to this point. I think we're at a a, a, a place where it, it's so unlivable for people right now that uh, we're at an inflection point. I would hope I would hope things can't really get worse. But I, I, I guess starting in the 20th century to now, how do we get to this point? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I mean, I completely agree. And I was actually just reading an article about like, you know, within when if inflation does go down, our price is going to follow. And and it, the answer was like, yes, for some things, but probably not rent and probably not like restaurant prices and services. So I was like, oh, um, to your to your good question, though, um, basically, you know, the federal government actually wasn't really involved in housing before the New Deal, before the 30s. There was sort of increasing pressure in the 20s for them to get in that space, but um, for the most part, they they really didn't. And then, um, but there, there started to be this movement saying the federal government needs to step up, they need to do more. And there was this brief window where like what do more was kind of had a lot of possibilities and could have gone in a lot of different directions. And there were different voices in the room pushing uh, for some much more social democratic and sort of expansive and creative than what we ultimately landed on. Um, but at the time, what we ultimately landed on still felt big because they hadn't done anything. Anyway, federal government, starting with the New Deal, created the federal public housing program, but they limited it only to the very poor. They sort of put all of these other um, restrictions in the program about the, like, the quality of architecture and design was, was very limited um, compared to sort of public housing that exists in other countries. We had a, the stereotypes about what people have about public housing are, are very much connected to the sort of rules and restrictions that Congress imposed on what those units could look like. Um, but, you know, basically they expanded, they were building around the country and then HUD was created in the 1960s. And as a result of sort of the federal government taking a bigger role, um, states and local governments stepped back, which they were kind of happy to do because housing politics gets so messy. I'm sure uh, listeners of the show know the phrase, NIMBY, not in my backyard. People fight affordable housing development. They think they have tons of you know, racist and classist stereotypes about who lives in affordable housing and the risk of their own home going down. Um, so basically we had a lot of, we had an expansion of, we subsidized home ownership. A lot of people got homes, but mostly white people, mostly, uh, you know, higher class people. And then we ended up in a situation over the last basically four or five decades where we stopped building new homes. So we have more people available who can't, there's not enough homes to, for them to go in the places they want to go. And then the homes that people do have are too expensive to afford and going up all the time, not matching wages. Um, so we both have a housing shortage and uh, we both, and housing is, is too expensive. And it's sort of the culmination of like, and, and on top of all of this, the federal government um, has really stepped back in, in building new housing and, and has the public housing program is stigmatized and they've stopped construction on that since the 90s. So that's that's kind of the landscape of 2022, where there's like not enough housing. The federal government's not doing really enough at all, and state and local governments have, have largely stepped back from kind of taking a leadership on this issue. When um, the HUD was developed, or even before that, when the federal government began to uh, have involvement in in housing, and I guess it was like the Housing Acts of uh, of 37, and I'm forgetting the other year that it, um one of them was but um the w was reserving it for the poorest a deliberate action to essentially uh 
cloister this program so that it wouldn't expand more? Or was it more of um, a, a way to actually target acute poverty? I guess I'm wondering what the motivations right. were, because obviously it contributed to the stigmatization that we saw in the 80s and 90s and allowed for Reagan and Clinton to bleed it dry. But, um, you know, it, I'm wondering what the the right. reasoning behind it uh, was. So uh, I think, because I know we do have some of these debates sometimes now, at the time, I think sort of, it's very fair to say, like, a big reason that they ended up limiting it to just the very poor was because um, the real estate industry and businesses, they didn't want to have to compete with the federal government on building houses. They were sort of getting all this new infusion of, of financing also from the New Deal. And um, so if the federal government is going to step into building housing like let's limit sort of they, they convinced them that the best way to do it would be to sort of just target this population like we'll handle everyone else although like what we've seen is they are not they've not handled everyone else and and everyone else is still struggling and the result of that is you know uh the the people not well served by the private market also kind of resent the public housing because they're not being served by the government um so i think to your point um it's not that like there are some times I think where means uh, tested programs are, you know, are not created with like ill intent or, or, or hoping it will fail the population. Um, but I think in this case, it was definitely uh, an example of like powerful interests sort of convincing the federal government, like, don't, don't extend your reach too broadly here. We, we want to be in that market. And was it also a way to, to, I, uh, continue to section off certain populations from others uh, what was this part and um part of the the redlining uh push that we saw during this time period um yeah i think i think like there there were definitely ways in which the, pub, the way that the public housing program was sort of implemented uh helped to keep residential segregation intact and certainly the way private the private home ownership um, market developed with like subsidizing the suburbs I mean today the suburbs are much more diverse but I think there's a reason why the leave it to beaver 1950s lily white picket fence image is so powerful in people's heads because for like you know four decades that really was kind of like the image of the suburbs now now it's it's changed, but I think even as suburbs have grown much more diverse, we still have that image of like, oh, suburbs are for white people and, 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 you know, cities are for black people. And that's obviously not true at all. But um, I think that's all sort of wrapped up in this history of public housing and private home subsidizing. And so we, you know, the the 60s end, there's this mass panic about cri uh, crime. Right, we move right. into the 70s. And then particularly in the 80s, the Reagan administration, then the Clintons in the 90s, um, even though HUD was established and maybe had this brief moment in the sun, Reagan in particular completely decimates HUD's uh, budget. And um was there any it, it seems like there because the federal government spearheaded this and they were the ones at the forefront of this uh of, of creating public housing to this degree that s state governments and um in local governments weren't necessarily prepared to take this on is that an accurate assessment of how things kind of fell apart yeah i think it's a mix of i think both they sort of i mean to some extent they lacked capacity but i also think like you know to some extent i don't think they really wanted to take it on either i mean not that they wanted to like have their residents be without housing but um you know I, as one state legislator that i interviewed uh, about this in rhode island put it like you know their election cycles are every two years their their neighbors and constituents are are nimbies themselves often enough like they are the same sort of dynamics that like make it hard to build new housing. Like you hear about these city council meetings where people turn out to fight any bit of development or apartment or, or any kind of affordable unit for low-income people. Um, those 
same people are the people voting for the state and local politicians. So it's like, it takes, I think, I think what is good, and I guess we'll get more into this later, but like, I think there, we're starting to see a bit more leadership, <laughs> but a lot of it, I would say, is it was easy for um, politicians on the state and local level to sort of not be, to be like, well, that's the federal government's job. And it's really politically hard because to do the right thing in a lot of these situations is you you have to basically say to someone like, yeah, the, the value, the, the appreciation of your property may go down, but this is the right sort of thing to do if we're trying to build inclusive, stable cities. And that's really hard for a politician to do, although it's like what they have to do, I think. And and then you see, kind of see uh, the the beginning of this proliferation of like private management of public housing in certain urban areas. And um, the I, we can talk about that a bit, but I, I didn't want to delay too much before we got to your story to see how states are responding to this. But I think that devolution is important to understand how we got to this point right now. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, um, so, oh yeah, go on. A little bit oh, of a no, lag no, for you. Apologize. Um, no. Okay, so yeah, so now your story talks a bit about how um, Rhode Island in particular, the state legislature in June approved this new pilot program for meant to target housing. Um, can you talk a bit about that program and what makes it different um, and what makes it encouraging? maybe something that other states could follow. Um, yeah, and and I should say, and this was my story and I, and I feel bad about it, but it's it's certain, it only adds to the thing. I actually learned following my story coming out, my story looked at a couple of states, Rhode Island was a big one, Colorado, Hawaii, California. Um, it turns out like three years ago, Massachusetts actually I think they were, I think Massachusetts was first and that they have been doing on a smaller scale. Um, but what they've been doing, which is which is really new, some, like arguably not done since pre-New Deal, is they are, the state is stepping up saying, we're going to put money in to develop our own, develop new mixed income housing, affordable and market rate, and we're going to own it. And, and we're going, that's going to be, and I think something to understand is that, and you kind of briefly mentioned this earlier, but in the 1990s, Congress uh, like basically effectively made it so that it's really, really hard now to build any new federal public housing due to something called the Fair Cloth Amendment. Um, that's something Alexander Ocasio-Cortez has been trying to repeal, um, but it is still around. And so it's why um, I mean, right now with federal public housing, there's tens of billions of dollars in backlog repairs. That's where the leaky roofs and the clogged toilets and the mold and the asbestos, all that stuff that's not getting repaired. Congress is not is behind in funding those repairs, but they also are not building new units. We're, we're, we're fighting to maybe keep the units we have intact and out of disrepair. So what is really what's really interesting and to me exciting about what's happening in those states I was mentioning earlier, like Rhode Island, is they're saying, okay, the federal government can't build new public housing for all the reasons we just talked about, but we are, are going to invest ourselves and we are going to build new housing and we're going to own it, which is really sort of kind of you know a very different way of thinking about housing because a lot of times the way affordable housing development has kind of worked in the past is like they've been on these like 15 20 year subsidy things and the government will, will basically give tons and tons of subsidies to a private company and then the private company will build it and they will be under certain restrictions about how high they can charge in rent but then after the 15 20 years runs up then it's out of their hands and then becomes and then you know might not even stay affordable after that and it can become in, a, in the private hands. So this is like new in the sense that they're building housing and they're saying, and we're gonna keep it. And we're gonna also capture all the value that comes from owning that you know, unit. And we might be able to reinvest that in more housing production or other social services. And so I find it like a very interesting example of how the public sector is thinking about flexing its muscles. 
proposals that they haven't really done in a very long time. Well, I mean, it's just it, it's common sense, frankly, to if taxpayer money not to use a, 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 an old, I guess, you know, small C conservative political term. But if taxpayer money is going towards the subsidization of this, then the government should should own it. They should be the public developer of this project as opposed to just subsidizing it under private management, which is wildly inefficient. But it's just a way to to get around the easiest answer to these questions which i think a lot of members of our government don't actually want to reckon with it reminds me of i use this example all the time during covid nancy pelosi bending over backwards for cobra subsidies as opposed to temporary ex temporarily expanding medicare because right. you know we can't do that because of what that might lead to as opposed to just doing what's most straightforward and and i think i do think part of what's happening here is you know Public housing, federal public housing, doesn't have a great reputation right now. Um, I think part of that is because, you know, of, of rules and, and, you know, defunding that Congress has done. Um, and it doesn't mean all public housing has to be bad. We have strong models elsewhere, and some some states do a better job than others. But what it, but what it has meant is that people, there's a lot of skepticism right now that the government can can get in the housing game and do it well. And like that there's, there's say, well, they think of the Robert Taylor homes in Chicago, which is sort of like the notorious example of, of you know, segregated, underfunded, problematic towers. Um, and so part of what I think is, for all the people who are, who are getting into this space, they're saying, look, yes, mistakes were made. Yes, we know there are all these problems with federal housing program, but that doesn't mean we can't get it right. And that doesn't mean we're, we're doomed to make the same mistakes again. And so I think a lot of what's happening now and a really sort of very competent kind of successful uh, place where this is happening is in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, and that's at the county level. But like, that's a place where they are showing how you, how this can be done, how it can be done in the kind of apartments you or I would probably love to live in, like next to transit, really nice looking. You can't even, you wouldn't even know it's public housing in the traditional sense of what we sort of imagine that to look like. Um, and I think part of what this will require is just getting like some more proof points like Montgomery County, like maybe like Rhode Island, more like Massachusetts and Colorado and Hawaii to sort of help people kind of shake the stereotype of what they think American governments building housing can look like and mean, because we have such a stigmatized image based on you know how the federal program has has kind of shaken out well the f federal program they've made it anemic and then they say well it's unfixable and so we exactly. are we're, we're putting a moratorium on it and when you talk about montgomery county um that is a suburb right and and so that i think changes uh, uh the the conversation around public housing as well um, and also just the outcomes, because right. we've seen urban sprawl, people having to move out of the cities in order to afford a place to live. Um, and it, when you, I think, make public housing more widespread as opposed to confines to certain areas of the cities, then you're including middle class renters as well, as you write about, which m might make these programs more durable. Yeah, I, I think I think that's completely right. Like we have this idea of like public housing being this thing only in like low income, you know, uh, majority black neighborhoods in urban areas, which like is not I mean, the, it's like we know the affordable housing crisis is affecting people all over. It's not limited to there. We can use, you know, governments can be helping people all over. I think that's why, you know, um, the the thing that most that a lot of lawmakers were, were basically saying was like we just uh, this crisis is so bad we need to be more aggressive about how we get involved. Um, and I think you're right that like showing that we can kind of showing that you can you can you can do this in rural areas you can do this in suburbs you can do this in cities and and it could benefit um, you know some people would probably live in those units and pay market rent which will help keep it going and you. 
we also know that there are so many middle class families who are really struggling with housing right now too. This is definitely not only limited to the very poor, but we have a problem right now where there's just not even enough units for people to live in as they're you know, grow families and, and population goes up. So I think there's a lot of potential for this. Of course, like, you know, it will require um, capacity and like, and planning and skills and, and federal investment would be helpful. I think that was something that I kind of heard from people, which was saying like, they're hoping that if they can kind of show they have a good, that they can do this on the state level, that will then, then HUD hopefully will, you know, there's things HUD can do to support um, the state and local governments that want to pursue this, and and uh, hopefully they're paying attention. <laughs> you mentioned the Faircloth Amendment, and I just I, I've we we've talked about it on the show before, but I'm hoping that we can refresh the audience's memory here because this really is. Um, I'm I, I'm encouraged by your piece about these local governments and uh, coming up with creative solutions here, and it seems really promising. But from a federal level, it is jarring how um, it's for, been been for two decades that there has been essentially a moratorium on the construction of any new federally funded public housing, which I don't know if people are aware of. Yeah, honestly, I hadn't been aware of it until like two years ago, and I had been writing about housing for much longer than that, which is, I mean, it's my fault, but also it, it I think even people really active in housing are, I, I think ASD has been really helpful in bringing more attention to it. Um, but I, it also speaks to something that um, uh, is kind of connected to this, is this, there's not really, outside of New York City, New York City is kind of the maybe the one major exception, there's not really a very organized constituency for public housing right now. Um, there's a big organized political constituency for the low income housing tax credit and other sorts of subsidized affordable construction and community development corporations and all these nonprofits that, that kind of want to capture those um, funds. But there, there's not a great uh, organized constituency for people calling to to overturn the Faircloth Amendment to to build more public housing. I think a lot of people probably have not heard of the rental assistance demonstration program or the RAD program, which is what the federal government since 2012 has basically been doing. You kind of reference it to sort of uh, convert traditional public housing into basically Section 8 uh, vouchers, which is, you know, a different program that is not that's that is still a one affordable housing program that we have, but it's on, in the private sector and it, or, you know, it's, it's connected with private um, landlords and it's not in the traditional public housing program. And I think, you know, there's sort of one thing that advocates for this new model and my story mentioned was they were saying, we're sort of hopeful that if we can get more states off the ground doing this in the next three to five years, then hopefully that will also create new constituencies that can then go to Washington and kind of, um, you know, make that case and be that voice that we don't really have in a great way right now. Last question. Um, the, the power of these real estate developers, um, I, I think, can't be understated. I'm, it's, it's fairly shocking that these states are standing up to them because it seems like our federal government can't. And uh, especially in a city like New York City, the the slumlord that, um, or maybe I shouldn't call him that, but fine, whatever, that uh, <laughs> was responsible for that massive fire that killed all of those people here in New York City was served on Eric Adams' transition committee, uh, or his transition team, I should say. It, it's so deeply ingrained, particularly in these big cities that have become synonymous with gentrification like San Francisco and New York um, and Brooklyn in New York. So, um, I mean, if you don't mind just talking about how in your reporting you've uh, um, encountered some of these big real estate groups and, and how much power they have over governments from the federal to the local level. Yeah, it's a good question. I think right now um, we don't have a we don't have a great sense right now over what this comp 
opposition will look like. I think a lot of them don't even necessarily know what's happening yet. Like it's sort of been kind of under the radar, that Rhode Island thing, you know, just passed in June. Colorado's was just this year too. Um, California's didn't pass, but like uh, did, you know, they think it stands a shot next year. Hawaii's just passed this year. So um, to, to some extent, we're going to have to sort of wait and see. I think there are some aspects about it that might, um, like, while they might not be able to own the properties, which they might, you know, there are opportunities in Montgomery County, I think is kind of demonstrating this where like, you could still have a private company build it. So you could, the government could still hire, you know, a private developer to do the actual construction. Um, but then it would be under, like, they probably do that with schools too, but then it's under um, public ownership at the end. And so I, I think it will be kind of interesting to see how, we shouldn't be naive about this, I think, like, as, as I think your point, and I completely agree, but there are ways in which um, it would, it will be sort of interesting to see how state and local government sort of manage their local lobbies, because you could sort of get things through potentially by saying, well, we'll still work with you, you know, even if you won't have this. And I don't know. It, I, I really don't know right now how they're going to fight it. I think there's such a, it, it might really depend. So far, the lawmakers who've kind of done it have just been like, we need to be more aggressive. We need to try more things. Um, and I kind of hope they keep that spirit as opposition likely, up, you know, increases over time in different forms. Well, uh, Rachel Cohen uh, of Vox, I really appreciate your time today, Rachel. Uh, oh, yeah. You can read her piece on this called How State Governments Are Reimagining American Public Housing. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your great questions. Okay, of course. Too.